Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover how the stimulus to fatigue ratio impacts exercise selection for hypertrophy training. First and foremost, let's cover what exactly the stimulus to fatigue ratio means. It should first be understood that this is a theoretical concept that cannot really be quantified, which makes it difficult to define exactly what it is. However, the general concept is that each exercise we perform induces both a hypertrophic stimulus and a fatigue cost. We will now cover in more detail what each of these two factors mean. The stimulus side of the equation refers to how well the exercise stimulates muscle growth. Like we mentioned, this is not quantifiable, but we can use indirect indicators to assess the hypertrophic stimulus. These indicators aren't direct measures of the hypertrophic stimulus, they are just factors that can probably tell us that the exercise we are using is effective at training the muscle we want to target. There are multiple indicators we have, and it is unlikely that we will experience every single one for every single exercise. However, the more that each indicator is experienced, higher the chances are that the exercise is effective. Let's now cover what these indicators are. First is anatomy and biomechanics of the target muscle. This is the most important indicator because this determines what muscles will be trained in the first place. Essentially, we need to select exercises that actually require the muscle we are trying to train to dynamically contract against resistance. If we don't consider anatomy and biomechanics of the target muscle, we may not be training it at all. So first and foremost, make sure the exercise involves the target muscle as a prime mover. The next consideration for the hypertrophic stimulus of the exercise is range of motion. This refers to the degree of lengthening and shortening of fibers of the target muscle. Generally speaking, greater range of motion usually results in more muscle growth per set. Even if two exercises train the same general muscle groups, one exercise may take the muscle through a larger range of motion than the other. Therefore, trainees should preference exercises which train the muscle through a larger range of motion in consideration with all other factors too. The next indicator that the exercise is providing a good hypertrophic stimulus is the mind-muscle connection. The mind-muscle connection refers to the perceived sense of contraction of the target muscle group. In other words, how much do we feel the muscle contracting during the exercise itself? If we feel a strong sense of muscle contraction in the muscle we are trying to train, then it is more likely that we are providing a good hypertrophic stimulus. It should be noted that the mind-muscle connection is more relevant for some exercises over others. Generally, this is more relevant to isolation lifts over compounds. This is because during isolation lifts, there is only one primary muscle working, so full attention can be focused on this muscle. During compound exercises, where accessory and stabilizer muscles are working too, we are less likely to feel a strong mind-muscle connection in a single muscle group because our senses are occupied with many other feelings around the body. This doesn't mean that the hypertrophic stimulus is inherently worse, it just means that the mind-muscle connection aspect won't be as reliable for compounds. Furthermore, some muscles naturally feel more of a mind-muscle connection than others. For example, a muscle like the triceps generally experiences a very strong connection during isolation lifts, while the delts don't necessarily experience the same level of connection. The next indicator we have is the muscle pump. This is the feeling that lots of blood has been directed to the trained muscle, and it has a feeling of fullness. In reality, the pump is an accumulation of blood and metabolic byproducts in the muscle, which have been directed there as a result of metabolic stress. If a trainee is targeting a specific muscle group, and between sets it has a feeling of fullness, then this is probably a good indicator that you are in fact training that muscle well, and it is receiving an effective hypertrophic stimulus. The pump is more relevant during higher rep work and when short rest periods are taken between sets. This is because both these factors will maximize metabolic stress. Therefore, during lower rep sets with heavier loads and moderate to long rest periods, the pump is less of a reliable indicator. And the last general indicator we have is muscle soreness. This refers to the soreness experienced in a local muscle tissue, usually the following day after exercise. We don't know exactly what causes this muscle soreness, although it is theorized that it is probably due to microtrauma of the muscle cells, residual metabolic byproducts in the muscle, or a combination of both. Muscle soreness is another good general indicator that our training was effective at targeting the specific muscle group. If we feel slight soreness the following day in the muscle we were trying to target, then we probably provided an effective hypertrophic stimulus. Some muscles naturally experience more soreness than others, and this may also vary between trainees. Generally, muscles which are able to experience a high degree of stretch under load often experience the most soreness. 
For example, the hamstrings usually experience significant soreness in most trainees, while a muscle group like the delts may almost never get sore. However, we also need to be aware that muscle soreness is often exaggerated as a result of novel exercise. So if we change exercises in our program, we are more likely to experience a muscle soreness compared to performing the same exercise each week for multiple months in a row. Therefore, it is important to understand that soreness is one of many indicators. It is not something that we should actively chase. Now that we understand the stimulus portion of this ratio, let's cover what fatigue means. Fatigue essentially refers to the cost of the exercise and how much it taxes our relevant systems. There are two forms of fatigue we are concerned with, which we will now cover. First is joint stress. This refers to how much stress is experienced by a specific joint or region during the exercise. This is a local form of fatigue to each tissue in the body, meaning that joint stress on one tissue doesn't affect other tissues. Each exercise induces some form of joint stress to the joints involved, but some exercises induce more stress to different joints than others. There is ultimately a limit to how much stress each joint can handle before it experiences pain or irritation. If we don't respect this threshold and push through pain, it may result in chronic injury over time. Furthermore, each individual will have different tolerances for each joint based on training history, injury history, individual variation in anatomical structure, and perception of pain. We generally want to select exercises that minimize joint stress. Excessive joint stress will limit how much volume we can perform, which may limit the overall hypertrophic stimulus of the program. It should also be noted that tissues are able to adapt to the demands of training stress. This means that we can develop a greater tolerance to specific exercises over time and can handle more volume with the same exercises before developing joint pain or irritation. And the second form of fatigue is systemic fatigue. Systemic fatigue is a very vague and non-specific concept. This refers to the recovery capacity of the entire organism, including all forms of stress. Like the principle of joint tolerance, there is only a finite amount of stress individuals can handle at any given point in time, and breaching this threshold will have negative health and performance consequences. Breaching systemic capacity will increase the risk of illness, inhibit lifting performance, and have negative effects on hormone regulation and essential bodily functions. Training is one contributor to systemic fatigue, but other stresses include work stress, family and relationship stress, sleep or lack thereof, and other physical activity. Some exercises induce greater systemic fatigue than others. Generally, heavier compound lifts result in greater systemic fatigue than lighter isolation lifts, as they require greater coordination, heavier loads to be lifted, and more total musculature to be actively contracting during the exercise. For example, deadlifts will probably induce much greater systemic fatigue than a bicep curl. We want to select exercises which minimize systemic fatigue. This is because like joint stress, total systemic fatigue will limit how much volume we can perform in our training program and therefore limit hypertrophy outcomes. So what influence does the stimulus to fatigue ratio have on exercise selection? Well, essentially, trainees should try to select exercises with the best stimulus and lowest fatigue cost. This will allow us to achieve the best hypertrophy response from the exercise while minimizing how much joint stress and systemic fatigue we induce. There are no exercises we must perform for hypertrophy training because it is not a performance outcome. Therefore, trainees can experiment with what exercises provide a good hypertrophic stimulus and what exercises minimize fatigue. We want to minimize fatigue so that we can perform more total training volume or maximize the stimulus of a given training volume. This will also likely help to keep our joints healthier for the long term and make training a more sustainable process. To better understand the concept of the stimulus to fatigue ratio, let's use an example. For this example, let's assess the stimulus and fatigue of the conventional deadlift. The conventional deadlift is a compound lift that allows trainees to lift very heavy loads relative to the strength of the lifter. In terms of hypertrophic stimulus, the conventional deadlift mainly aims to target the glutes and hamstrings. However, it doesn't take these muscles through a very large range of motion and may even be limited in performance by other accessory muscles before the target muscle. In terms of fatigue, the conventional deadlift induces a very high systemic fatigue cost because almost all muscles in the body are working to stabilize and very heavy loads are able to be lifted. In terms of joint stress, the conventional deadlift also generally taxes the lower back quite significantly. Therefore, the overall stimulus to fatigue ratio for this exercise is probably quite poor. This doesn't mean that trainees can never perform this lift. It just means that trainees should be careful not to perform too much volume with a conventional deadlift if their goal is to maximize muscle hypertrophy. 
Instead, trainees may want to select an exercise with a more favorable stimulus to fatigue ratio. Something like a back extension or a stiff leg deadlift probably provides a better hypertrophic stimulus to the glutes and hamstrings and also induces much less fatigue. This will allow trainees to perform more volume for these muscle groups or get a better stimulus with the same amount of volume. To summarize all this information, let's establish some practical recommendations. First and foremost, there are no mandatory exercises for hypertrophy training. Therefore, trainees should not become emotionally attached to any specific exercise if their goal is to maximize muscle growth. Instead, we should focus on what exercises provide us with the best stimulus to fatigue ratio. This refers to exercises that will provide the best hypertrophic stimulus and the lowest fatigue cost. This will help trainees achieve the best hypertrophic stimulus per unit of volume and keep training healthy and sustainable for the long term. However, trainees may still want to include some exercises which don't have the best stimulus to fatigue ratio if they have simultaneous strength goals or they simply enjoy performing these lifts. However, volume should be limited for these exercises to not breach our joint tolerance and systemic capacity. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.